trust yourself again. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. did you, what kind of psychological things did you do to reach a place of peace? Oh man, I think peace is uh, compound. You know, like we ha- we're we're always adding to our own peace to our in our space of of you know meditation and our our um our internal zen and we're all adding we're always that's that's compound we're always grow that's always growing so but the things that i'm i certainly don't think that i'm there i haven't arrived but the things that have been really helpful to me are empathy and forgiveness hmm. and also something that oh man who shared this with a, a good friend of mine shared this with me recently the idea of self-compassion instead of self-esteem because oh, self-esteem is contingent Okay. Self-esteem means I have to be successful. I have to be better than someone else. I have to I have to be successful for my self-esteem to be there. But when I'm not successful, when I fail, which I'm inevitably going to fall short, right, right. my self-esteem is not there for me. Mm. I lose self-esteem. But self-compassion, self-compassion says, hey, listen, man, I love you and so right. I hope y'all got y'all pencils out. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's all right to be you. <laughs> and and that all that self-compassion to me creates the environment to be creative because then there's not an agenda there's not right. for the self-esteem you know it's like self-compassion i'm already like like what, what i said earlier this is this is a janism right here man is i uh um i have a lot to offer and nothing to prove damn you know there it is these are just just like <laughs> just committing to that stuff though you mm-hmm. know man that stuff is difficult to commit to yeah those ideas especially living in a, a city like new york as you know as we've oh. talked about many times yeah man Wow, Peter. Shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you, bro. Man, I don't even know what to ask you next. Okay, I got one. Okay. Now, why why did you choose to uh, to move to New York City? You know what I mean? You play trombone. Nobody don't want a trombone player. <laughs> man, <laughs> you know, I... You thought you were going to get a Sesame Street kid? Green. Yep. There it is. I'm just playing, guys. I'm a trombone player. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Corey but, Wallace. But hey, man, if anybody from Sesame Street is watching this, you know, my my website might be in the link. I don't know. Yeah, oh, we'll, we can put yeah, his yeah, website yeah. right up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, so uh, so I do really, I do have to express, I do like deeply, deeply love Tramone. And um, it's not, you know, no one's going to pretend that Tramone is, is not underrepresented. Um historically and and in modern times but i do man i have so much respect for the tremonas that are doing it today you know what i mean that ryan cabrile michael dees marshall jilks elliot mason um man there's so so many dudes my my contemporaries man like 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 cory wallace man mm-hmm. great musician man, great trombone player like um so i i uh i have so much love for trombonists and for the lineage of jazz trombone because it's so, it's so rich um and it was really important to me to be a part of that. Um, and it seems that in all of the musicians and a lot of the artists and, and authors that I respect and love the most, it seems like a lot of them lived in New York or at least had some, at some point in their life had some affiliation with New York. Okay. And I wanted, there, there's something here and there's something about that. All my favorite music is here. So it seemed like the natural move. Mm-hmm. That seemed like the natural move. So, man, coming from Michigan State, right? Mm-hmm. Mike D. Mike D's is your teacher. Michael D's was my teacher. Yeah, Rodney Whitaker. Rodney Whitaker. So, what are the two things? One thing you learn from each of them that you're gonna carry with you forever? Oh man, one thing from each of them. I don't. Man, that's. I learned so much from both of those gentlemen. <laughs> I learned. I still learned so much from both of those gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Um. Michael Dees told me a story one time about a video that he watched of J.J. Johnson. And um, in the video, J.J. just played like two notes. And he played it, he played, uh, I don't, it was just like a C in an E flat, a high C in an E flat. And, um, and Mike just talked about how moved he was by those two notes. And... Um, I mean that that's I guess that's a lesson that we all have to learn right is that it is not it's not about it's not so much about the 
all all this you know all this crazy content but it's about the intent behind that content and mike is a musician that i've never heard him play something that it doesn't sound like he really believes damn and okay. that's heavy man that's and even like i've just never heard you know what i mean like who what, how he plays is exactly who he is and that's mm-hmm. that's really cool and mm-hmm. to observe that was a gift and to to hear him talk about jj that same way was just these two notes just like so moving he meant it so you know that that was a great thing to both observe and to listen to him talk about that's with mike wow and rodney man rodney taught me more about mentorship than anyone else in my whole life rodney took me on i mean rodney definitely changed my life for sure he called i remember i was in marching band field uh I was about to, I was possibly going to go to Interlock, Interlochen uh, Fine Arts School for my junior year of high school and junior and senior year. And it was, I had the audition like two days later. And I was at a marching band rehearsal in Lansing, Michigan. And Rodney called me. He got my number from like my teacher, some, somebody. And he invited me because they, they needed trombone players to fill out their third jazz band. And he invited me to come play with Jazz Band 3. And I don't know if he knows how much that changed my life. Mm-hmm. But I had I had already had so much respect for the school and had gone to see their concerts all the time and had so much respect for the professors there. And um, I I went and played in Jazz Band 3 and I didn't go to Interlock and I stayed in Lansing and I finished out, which, I again, there are so many benefits to that too mm-hmm. that I'm now learning even more. Um, and then he just you know, he just took me under his wing. He I was teaching two days a week my freshman year in Detroit with Rodney, so I got to teach with professor whitaker i got to i got to watch him teach and i got to watch him mentor and at the same time be mentored by him and and, i mean just that man no one else in my whole life has taught me more about mentorship than rodney whitaker man what role does relationship building play in your success as a musician and a human being man the everything (laughs) <laughs> it's like I mean, yeah, I, every I mean, relationship building on on all fronts, man. Right? It's like professional relationships, business partnerships, and stuff like that, and also our personal relationships, our friendships, our romantic relationships, fam- familial relationships. I can go through every one of those and talk about how it's you know it's 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 been you know central to to my development both as a musician and as a human being. Um, and so I think I think it's it everything like your family is it, my I was. I have no misconceptions about how incredibly blessed I was with the family that I have. Like my, my, um, my parents split really early, but there, there was, I never saw any animosity between them. Cause that was, I was like two months old or something like that, you oh, know? Wow, and so okay. to me, to me growing up, uh, it was just normal. You know, I live with mom in Lansing, dad lives in Muskegon. It was not a, like a weird thing, you know, <laughs> as opposed to like people that split later and the kids are like three or four. That's exactly. a little more difficult to process. Yeah. So my family was always really supportive both my parents are super creative in their own right. My dad is a lifelong glass blower, so he I was just always doing creative stuff when I was a kid with him. And um my mother is uh is all about basically like uh community like development. Like she she works for a nonprofit. She's the director of a nonprofit, excuse me, for years that does all this stuff with with like bringing in senior programs and like affordable housing stuff, bringing in food a new food resource center into this place um like different jobs programs i mean it's she like it's she's creative in her own right in that thing and in that in that capacity and um they you know because of their own experiences and because of their um kind of professional autonomy uh they've they were always supportive of whatever you know field i was going to go into so when i said music they were like great awesome sounds good <laughs> and then That's my, great. you know our friends like you know you can't do anything without friends man mm-hmm. you know what i mean i uh and, and business relationships, you know, most of my business relationships are my friends now. Right, 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 right. You know, I actually, man, I'm going to tell the story the first time I met you. And we okay. Talk, we talk about this story and this, but this is really important. And this is something that is not unique to the, to the jazz world, but it's central to the jazz world in my experience. And we met on a, on a trio gig, a cute, uh, you know. Cubana you know, Social. Yeah, Cubana Social. Was four uh, years ago? With, yeah, with Kathleen, with Kathleen Murray. Three, year, three years ago, man. Three years ago. And, um, <laughs> and 
we, I remember like both of us were like kind of arriving, like almost late, you know what I'm saying? Like, al- like not late, but almost late. Like right. we were like, all right, we got like seven minutes to set up and then hit. Right. So we set up, we said, Hey, what's up, man? I'm Peter. Hey, what's up, man? I'm Darian. Um, and then we hit, we played the first set and we locked up real well. We locked up really well. And it was, it was one of those things where we're like, all right, all right, cool. <laughs> and then on the break, we were sitting at the bar and we just, I don't, we hadn't talked for like two minutes. So we, but we talked about something. And it just like it was super, just this really natural conversation. And then we were quiet for a minute, and you said, "Man, I think we should be friends." <laughs> and, I was, and I was like, "Yeah, man, that sounds great. Like, yeah, let's be friends." Yeah. And then you were like, "No, no, man, I don't know if you know what you're getting into, man. I don't know if you get, you know, when we're friend, when you know, when we're friends, you're fam." Right. right. And and I was like, "All right." Awesome. <laughs> and then like two days later, I went to your birthday party. Right. You know, like two days later, I went up to Harlem to your birthday party. So it was. And, but that's, that, you know, that's it, man. Like that, that family, you know what I mean? Is like, is so central to everything that I do, you know? So that, that has been, that's been the driving force in my relationship with music. Right. And, you know, all, all the stuff I do. Wow, man. Yeah. That's great. Damn. So Peter. thank you for that, man. I appreciate that. So just speaking of relationships and like, uh, you know, business relationships, mm-hmm. friendships, like the other element or the other level to the next level to that is love, yeah. romantic love. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, for me, I don't know. When I'm in love, I feel like, you know, I can play music better. You know what I mean? Like everything has meaning. Like what is it like for you when you're in love? Man. Or I must, you are in love. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you, you know, my girlfriend, Marta, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're all good friends. Um, and love, I mean, absolutely, it's all those good things, right? It's a source of inspiration, it's warmth, it's it's uh, you know, it's it's safety, you know, when like when when we are fearful, when we are hurt, when we're all, you know we're damaged by something, it's safety, it's it's condolence, and it's also, but it also challenges us, it challenges us, right? Like when you really love someone, you want to be the best person for them, right? And you want to be supportive and you know, empathize and, and be, you know, put, put them before you. And that's, you know, those are, those are, you know, big things that we have to learn how to do. And I have been really fortunate to share a lot of love in my life with a lot of different people. Um, you know, both, both platonically and romantically and every, everything. I mean, I've, I've learned so much from, from that love. And I think something that my mother taught me when I was really young, I don't, I don't even know like what context this was in, but she said that there's, there's lots of different kinds of love. Like we have this, we have this weird thing in our minds where like love is either romantic or familial and sometimes like friendship, you know what I mean? But that's like, that's, that's so, I mean, that just doesn't allow for any other variance, you know, or, or, or any other, like, I mean, there's like, there's a love and a trust between like a mentor and a student. You know what I mean? There's, there's love and trust between, you know, like a client of some sort and this, I mean, like there's lots of different, there's so many different types of love to me. And when we stop being afraid of that, you know, we can explore those different types of love and they don't, you know, so romantic love is amazing. And, but like when you realize there's all these other types of love that we cultivate, it also, it kind of takes the pressure off of mm-hmm. those of romantic and familial love to bear all of the responsibility to, you know, to satisfy our own needs for love. Right. So that's, I think that's really big is to not be afraid to love, not be afraid to explore all of these different types of love, you know? Yeah, man. That, yeah. <laughs> you want to something, man. You should write a book, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So listen, man, I want to, I want to change, switch gears real quick and talk about, I want to talk about New York City and cool. the challenges that you faced. You know what I mean? Some that you anticipated and others that you didn't anticipate. Like, what are those challenges and how do you continuously overcome those things as they come up? Mm. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to talk about there, right? I, uh, we all have an idea of New York when we move here, right? And some of those things are going to be true. And some are going to be totally wrong and some, you know what I mean? And some are things that we never thought of. So like, um, New York forces you to come, come, you know, to grips very quickly with what you need to do to survive. Firstly, you know, when, when you don't, you're like, okay, I want to, I want to play some music. 
and I want to, you know, I'm about to smash on giant steps right now, but I also really got to, you know, pay this rent and I got. <laughs>